Derailed, sick, bankrupt, late, and wreck. These are the words that be used to describe the mighty Penn Central. It was a flash in the pan, and within six years of this merger, the fallout from this railroad would cause national intervention, as the railroad collapsing would cause disaster in the Northeast. Yet, for the six years they existed, they were an iconic railroad for many. Their electric fleet would separate them from the rest of the country, with a mixture of the three large railroads, electric locomotive, and multiple units. Today's video will be actually focusing on these specific electric trains, showcasing how they evolved and were used on the Penn Central Railroad specifically. My name is Jamie, and if you like these sorts of videos, please like this video and subscribe if you are interested in more of these types of videos. Next week's video will actually be about an export model, also known as a British Class 59. An export model of the SC40-2, which managed to defeat British domestic models such as the British Class 56, 58 and the 60s, and would change the landscape of freight railways in Britain forever. On February 1968, the Penn Central would be born. Penn Central would be originally formed by the merger of Last Resort, Pennsylvania Railroad, and the New York Central. Later on, due to the demands of the Interstate Commerce Commission, the New Haven Railroad would soon join the merger on January 1st, 1969. Before we get into Penn Central itself, I think it would be important to have a look at the three separate railroads that made up the Penn Central. The first would be New York Central, before the merger, the New York Central was on the verge of being profitable. One person who had pushed for modernization was Alfred E. Perlman. He would be responsible for computerization on the railroad. The New York Central would also upgrade its yard to be automated, being able to handle 8,329 cars per day in Selkirk Yard, while he had also pushed for the reduction of main lines from four track to double track to reduce maintenance costs. He would also increase traffic by introducing centralized traffic control. It also meant that a single operator would be able to control trains between Erie and Cleveland. This was also introduced in other areas. This made it a modern railroad. On the other hand, the Pennsylvania Railroad was effectively the same railroad from 1948. It was incredibly slow at modernizing and embracing new forms of technologies. Under Alan J. Greeno, the last decade of the PRR would be in decline, both economically and the upkeep of the railway itself. Despite all of this, the Pennsylvania Railroad would be the largest of the three companies, both in terms of route mileage and manpower itself. The New Haven, throughout its existence, was a struggling railroad that went through multiple bankruptcies. This railroad was financially ruined from 1956 and would be placed under a trusteeship due to declaring bankruptcy in 1961. The New Haven was effectively a bankrupt firm and it was losing more and more traffic each day to competing forms of transportation such as road and sky. Penn Central itself, while being a united company on paper, was divided internally. Both companies had been in competition since their creation and had different cultures and practices. They would be effectively like oil and vinegar. Due to the PRR being the larger company during the merger, it would mean that the ex-Pennsylvania railroad managers would secure the top jobs in the company and the New York Central managers would move to other railroads due to the loosening of their top jobs. Another aspect of this merger that became problematic was the unions. Due to conflicting contracts with previous employers, confusion arose with working conditions and entitlements. Later, with the various computer systems also in place, things would get lost in the system, leading to hours and del days of delays. Everything had just been subject to deferred maintenance, the track, the trains, and the buildings. Due to the three companies that made up the Penn Central being some of the biggest pioneers 
of electric locomotives in North America, Penn Central would now have hundreds of electric locomotives. They would need to be repainted from their original railroad to the new Penn Central scheme. Due to the mess that Penn Central was from the get-go, there is an actual official colour. However, the reality is that workshops would also have their own practices. The base paint of the Penn Central itself would be a Brunswick green, which was also known as dark green locomotive enamel on the PRR. However, locomotives would also be patched up with black paint, and many of them would be repainted into this black paint itself as well. So what about the Penn Central logo? Like the paint scheme, the only thing consistent was the PC logo itself. Three variations of the PC logo would exist. PC logo in white, P in red with a C in white, and a P in orange and a C in white. Now, from understanding, it is believed that the orange is to symbolize the New Haven's merge into Penn Central itself. However, this has not been confirmed definitively. 60E44 locomotives would be transferred to Penn Central from Pennsylvania Railroad, with many of them being patched with a new Penn Central logo of white. E44-4440 would be special and receive the different variation of red P and white C logo. During the Penn Central years, 22 E44s would be upgraded to the E44A standard. Numbered 4438 to 4459, this program would upgrade the traction motors and replace the older Ignatron rectifiers with the new silicon diode rectifiers. This would mean that they were upgraded to about 5000 horsepower. The E44s would be the dependable rock that the Penn Central needed. The E44s were incredibly reliable, being noted that all they needed was sparks and sand to keep running. Many of these E44s would only receive paint jobs or interim paint schemes as the Penn Central would have bigger problems to deal with than painting old locomotives. They would be commonly used on all sorts of freight, with triple headeds being used on heavy mineral trains, with one exception being the very famous train that the triple E44s would be used on was the Tropicana Juice Train. This train was incredibly difficult to handle, as it was incredibly heavy, insulated, and it was speed restricted to 65 miles per hour, with some sections being restricted to 45 miles per hour, with rear helper engines being banned. The route for the E44s would be from Pot Yard to the Tropicana Staging Yard in Kearney, New Jersey. Now, if you're in that time and you drank juice, well, you know where it's from. And you gotta thank the E44s for that. In 1968, 119 GG1s would be on the books at Penn Central. The GG1 would remain relatively unmodified, only having modified gear ratios specializing some for freight usage and others for passenger services. The GG1s would be a solid locomotive for the Penn Central to depend on. Some of these would be initially patched with the new logos and some would remain in this paint scheme until they're transferred to Amtrak. For example, there are some to have been noted in 1976 to have the original single strike paint scheme and some with the original five strike paint scheme from the Pennsylvania Railroad days, but have been adorned with the Penn Central logo or Penn Central lettering instead. Some would be actually re fully repainted to have the full Penn Central paint scheme with a big Penn Central logo adorned on the side. Some of these would actually be given the special logo of the red P as well. With the introduction of the Metroliner service, the GG1s would be placed onto other services. They would take over a lot of the other passenger duties that would be originally run by locomotives such as the New Haven EP5. The formation of Amtrak in 1971 would see the transfer of 30 gg one from Penn Central and the lease of another 25. In the spring of 1976, 
with the Northeast Corridor being sold to Amtrak, another 11 would be transferred to Amtrak. All Amtrak GG1s would be renumbered to 900, therefore distinguishing them from the Penn Central ones. One of the most famous runs of the Penn Central era that was run by the GG1s would be the funeral train of Robert F. Kennedy, traveling from New York to Washington on June 8, 1968. At the end of the train, it would have the special observation car, Philadelphia. The E-33s would be a small fleet of 10 locomotives. They would have a relatively uneventful life, just by being useful and reliable. Being the smaller brother to the E-44s, they would be used on smaller freight trains, as they would only have 3,300 horsepower each. The E-33s would be also relatively cleaner than the bigger E-44 locomotives, as they would receive a fresh Penn Central black paint scheme in 1969. The electric float locomotives of the Penn Central would always be dirty, as they were not able to be washed using the car wash and would actually have to be cleaned with a mop and bucket, a service that would rarely happen. The smallest fleet of the big electric passenger locomotive was a New Haven's EP5. To do the constant bankruptcy and the deferred maintenance of the fleet of 10, only six would be operational in 1969. The four that were not operational were to be scrapped immediately under Penn Central instead of being repaired. They would also be renamed to E40 and be placed on commuter trains between Grand Central Terminal to New Haven. They would also be removed from the pride and joy of the New Haven, the Washingtonian, as they would be displaced by the Pennsylvania Railroad GG1s as the GG1s were simply more dependable and reliable compared to the EP5. The EP5s would be banned in 1973 due to 4971 catching fire in the Park Avenue tunnel. Due to this ban, the EP5 would enter storage. Due to the ban placed by the MTA, Amtrak would reject the idea of purchasing the EP5s from Penn Central. Instead, Two units would be rebuilt into freight-dedicated locomotives. This would involve the removal of third rail shoes, steam generators, and they would also be stripped of their second pantograph. One issue that killed the EP5 early on was the lack of a dynamic brake and being able to be used in multiple unit configurations. This meant they would be limited on their freight haulage and it would spell the end of the EP5s early on. The P2s would be the most modern of the ex-New York Central electric locomotives. Originally, 22 would be built in 1929 for the Cleveland Union Terminal project. They would be rebuilt into their final form as the P2s. This rebuild program would allow them to traverse the third rail system in the New York Central. 21 would be rebuilt into the P2 standard. They would have a quiet life mainly pulling trains from Croton Harmon into Grand Central Terminal. However, by the Penn Central era, their only job would be to relieve the E8 passenger trains and to take their passenger trains into their terminal. Amtrak's acquisition of the FL9, which were third rail capable and third rail equipped turbo trains, would cut their lives short, with all being scrapped starting in 1972. The team motor would be an old locomotive even by the Penn Central era, with their production beginning in 1913 and ending in 1926. They would be used in a mixture of all sorts of roles. However, with the inclusion of the FL9 into Penn Central, the FL9 electro diesels would allow them to travel on third rail power while being able to use its diesel engines to also travel further without being restrained like the team motors. The team motors would actually be scarce by 1969. The last role of the team motors would only be to be used as wire trains. However, this role would be eliminated by 1974. And with all being scrapped apart from one, where it would survive numbered New York Central 278, where it currently survives at the Danbury Railroad Museum. 
The S2 motors, originally built in the early 1900s, would survive longer than its younger brothers. 14 would actually survive into the Penn Central era. They would be rugged and dependable, where they would serve as small electric switches and would serve into the Conroe years. Following the bankruptcy in June 21st, 1970, the collapse of Penn Central would be a sign that the industry needed help. Penn Central would actually threaten to cease rail operations in 1973. This would leave the Northeast without any Class 1 railroad and would cripple the entire transport system on the Northeast. The railroad was in an incredibly bad shape. It was a railroad that had stationary derailments, where the sleepers had rot away and derailed rolling stock. It was a sick and dying railroad. With the Regional Rail Organization Act of 1973, Penn Central would be briefly nationalized in hopes of buying time for one of the greatest railroads of all time to be planned out and formed. The Penn Central would actually find itself begging for government aid, making videos showcasing the system's decline, begging for support. With the Railroad Revitalization and Regulatory Reform Act of 1976, the final system plan that would lead to Conrail would be actioned out, and Penn Central would transfer its equipment and trackage to the Consolidated Rail Corporation, also known as Conrail, and Amtrak. However, we'll be going into those later on in another video. Thank you for your continued support, and it's seriously appreciated. I hope I can always make content that you guys watch and enjoy. And I hope to see you at next week's video about the British SD40-2, also known as a Class 59. These are pretty interesting models by all standards as basically the SD40-2s, but built in Illinois for the British Railways. So don't forget to like this video. And I just want to say thank you for me, my partner, and my pet rabbit, Mr. Morris.